Welcome to another edition of Get Outside St. Tammany, a show dedicated to all things outdoors in St. Tammany Parish. My name is Amy Bouton and I am filling in for our host, Davis Brister. We're here today with Jeff St. Romain from Habitat for Humanity St. Tammany West affiliate. So can you just tell us a little bit about uh, what your role is with Habitat? All right. In my role, I work real closely with um, my direct reports who um, we have a construction director who's a licensed con a residential contractor, a development director, a director of finance, and a restore director. And we, we work together to ensure that we're able to go ahead and build houses and address the need for quality housing here in, the, in West St. Tammany Parish. So that all kind of ties into your mission, obviously, what you mm -hmm. do and everyone right. else says and the restore mm -hmm. does, mm -hmm. every kind of area of habitat ties into right. your mission, which is overall right. what? Our, our mission is putting God's love into action. We bring people together to build homes, communities, and hope. So um, tell us how someone would become involved with Habitat and how they would sign up to, say, volunteer to help you build a home. Sure. We build year-round, uh, Tuesday through Saturday, except for the week between Christmas and New Year's. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a, a website, habitatstw.org. You can go online there and sign up to be a volunteer. Or you can call our volunteer coordinator, Danielle, at 985-893-3172, extension 222. Okay, so um, say someone wanted to volunteer. Say mm -hmm. I wanted to volunteer mm -hmm. or I wanted someone in my family to volunteer, mm -hmm. my son or daughter. Right. Uh, what kind of skills would someone need to possess to do that? Because obviously you're building homes mm -hmm. from the ground up. Right. Yeah, you really don't need any skills. We have a great construction staff that are very patient and are great teachers. And people find when they get there in the morning, they frequently don't imagine what they're going to learn by that afternoon. And so that's what is really unique about the Habitat model is that the volunteers can see a beginning of, of the home from right. the wall raising and then later can come back at the time that the home is dedicated and the family moves into the home. And tell us what the family's involvement is. In other words, I guess, how do you choose the families or right. how do they choose sure. you? Well, um, families hear about us from different um, social service agencies in the parish. They hear about us from coworkers, um, neighbors, family members, or whatever. They come to us, and then we go through a pretty in intensive process where we go ahead and look at their credit, their criminal background history, their willingness to partner with us. Mm -hmm. And we look at um, what type, what's their housing situation? Are they rent burdened? Are they living in substandard housing? Um, and so we take all of that into account, and we also take people, our, our focus is people who make between 30% and 60% of area median income. Okay. So these are people that a, that a normal mortgage lender would not loan them money to buy a house. Right. So we go ahead and work with them to, to, so that they can purchase a house through an affordable mortgage. Okay, but so when you say their willingness to partner with right. you, that kind of caught my attention. Right. Sure. Um, what does that mean? Sure. What is their... Well, what, what you, if you're a single adult, um, you're required to put in 300 hours of sweat equity, and that's working on your home as well as other homes, and also includes um, classroom time. Okay. And um, home buyer counseling, financial fitness, understanding your mortgage, minor home repair. Mm -hmm. So it takes, it takes a person, a family, to go, about a year to go through that process. If it's a couple, they have to put in 400 hours. Okay. And so during that year, if for whatever reason people, um, their income changes or they don't have the time to, to do their sweat equity hours, then they would drop out of the program and would have the opportunity to come back into the program when they're ready to do this. But it's a real partnership, and um, we really stress the importance and the, the requirement, as any of us who buy a home, of, of home um, owners paying their mortgages. Mm -hmm. Other people's mortgages help build their homes, and their mortgages are going to help build other people's homes. So it's this whole sort of layered, connected mm -hmm. um, service that not only do they get something out of it, they're giving back, and right. kind of that mm -hmm. fosters that sense of service in right. them and their family. So right. that's great. And you know, Habitat likes to say it's not a, it's not a handout, it's a hand up. Right. And that's what we're doing. We're giving people the opportunity to, to go ahead and do, do their sweat equity and sign 
for that 30-year affordable mortgage. So they don't get just get given the home. No, they no. purchase the home, they purchase the and home. they are invested in the home, mm -hmm. and they're invested in the next generation mm -hmm. of homes right, that come right, up in our right. area. And you know, we've built 255 homes to date here in West St. Tammany, with, with most of them being since Hurricane Katrina. And the great majority of our homeowners pay their mortgage every month. Those that that for whatever reason decide not to pay their mortgage, mm -hmm. then we're, we're also a, a mortgage company. Mm -hmm. And so we follow all the mortgage laws. And we, you know, in terms of, we'll work with people because our, our homeowners are hourly wage workers. And we know their hours get cut, right. or they're hospitalized, you happen. know. So we'll work with them. But unfortunately, in a few cases, and fortunately it is a few cases, we have to foreclose on families because it's a real commitment and it is a, um, a, a requirement. That, that you pay your mortgage, like all right. of us. And the longevity of the program depends on it. Exactly, yes. So. It's a key part of our funding. It's one of the parts right. of our funding. Yeah. So take us through a day in the life of a volunteer when they show up at the okay. build site. What happens? Well, they would show up at the build site about 8 o'clock in the morning. We do a morning circle where we go ahead and everybody introduces themselves. The construction staff then goes over the tasks that are going to be done that day. Mm -hmm. um, they go through all the safety um, precautions that the... That the um, uh, builders, the, the volunteers need to know, and then they divide up people to go ahead. And this group will be doing, you know, maybe doing today, um, um, putting in flooring in the house. Uh, right. a, another group may be um, working on the exterior of the house, putting up the hardy plank siding. Mm -hmm. And so it just depends on what day a person comes and where we're at in the construction process. And we usually have a number of homes under construction at the same time. Okay. So. Um, we have a, a variety of tasks to do usually on, on any given day. And you mentioned that you build homes year-round. Are there mm. any times that are maybe busier than others? Do you have special occasions that well, you build homes or special well, events? We see less volunteers in the summer months, as you can imagine, because of the heat and humidity. Right. Um, we, um, in October, we do a very special thing called Women Build. The mm -hmm. teams of primarily women come out and they build in the month of October. And uh, we, we had over 400 women come out last October and those women raised $110,000 toward the construction of those of those wow. homes. So that's a big project for us, yeah. is Women Build. And then in the winter months, uh, college students from the cold weather states come down here for their winter and spring breaks, spend a week um, building with us, spend a few days in the French Quarter, and then go back up, up north. Yeah. So let's talk about, uh, speaking of sort of younger adults and a mm -hmm. younger kids who are about to be adults. Mm -hmm. What is the minimum age you have to be to volunteer on a site? You have to be 16 years of age okay. at, um, to do that. And we have um, high school uh, students who come out and volunteer with us. Uh, uh, St. Paul's High School has a Habitat Club, um, which is run by a, a teacher there, Mr. Richard Pichon, mm -hmm. and that group comes out every Saturday during the school year. So what about uh, groups that need service hours and things? Because mm -hmm. you know a lot of times you'll have mm -hmm. some of all schools right. basically mm -hmm. require some form right. of service for whatever reason, mm -hmm. clubs and things like that. So right. is that a yeah, that's open. We have we've had students from um, you know Mandeville High School and Fountain Blue High School come out and build with us. Those younger than 16, they can volunteer in our restore, okay. where we sell used items, and um, they can help us there because um, that that store, the profits of that store, helps us build three houses a year. Okay, mm -hmm. and so, so what are some volunteer areas in the store like that that they would do? Well, it could be doing everything from um, stocking the shelves as, mm -hmm. as, as people price the different items because the donations come in all the time, and they could price and then stocking the shelves. It, again, it just depends on the day. It could be um, helping to load customers' cars when they, mm -hmm. when they buy some things where they need some help with, with things. Right. It could be cleaning up an area. Um, are wiping down furniture that gets donated to us. So a variety of things. Okay. Um, you know, for our home, for our home buyers that are, are handicapped or elderly, they one of the things that they do in our restore, um, because of their lack of mobility, they fold clothes that are donated to us. Okay. So we'll find different tasks to to, to meet the needs of a person, what they can and cannot do. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about, we kind of know the homeowner um, goes into it with the expectation mm -hmm. of home ownership right. and then they're going to go ahead and pay that forward with their own sweat equity mm -hmm. in their home and the next home. Right. But the volunteers, what can you say um, sort of as a person who sees the whole system mm -hmm. in play all mm -hmm. the time, what have you noticed that the volunteers kind of get out of that? Even if, I, I would imagine some volunteers are kind of voluntold to go mm -hmm. occasionally, you know, mm -hmm. especially the younger mm -hmm high school kids. A lot of people talk about that they went there to help out and they didn't realize how much that was going to help them. Mm -hmm. Because I think what's really what's really unique about Habitat 
is the, the chance to go out and, and many, depending on the person's work schedule, getting a chance to meet that home buyer and, um, and build, work in that house and then coming back when the house is dedicated and seeing that your hands have helped go ahead and build this house that this, this family is now purchasing. Right, you're settling yeah. a family in. Yeah. You know, today we, we had a woman came, come in and she's doing a lease purchase of her home and she came in and I thought she was sick at first. She had a washcloth to her face, mm -hmm. but she was crying tears of joy. Mm -hmm. And you know, so, sometimes I know we all get take it for granted that we have a home, but there are people in West St. Tammany that have grown up in some very substandard apartments and trailers. And for this young mother, this was, we had to wait about five or 10 minutes for her to pull herself together emotionally to go through the lease purchase with her. But it really, it really hits home when you meet the, the, the parents and, but, but even more so when you meet the children, because mm -hmm. what we're doing is we're providing a stable place for those children to live, and they will be able to stay in the same school and, um, and then go on. And, and it's, it's, we're always excited when we hear about home, children have grown up in our homes that are now in college or have, are, in, um, have, are going to technical or community colleges. Right. Because we, we know that we're breaking that cycle of, you know, their parent may have been the first one in their family ever to own a home, they'll be the first one in their family to go to college. So it can um, impact generations, yeah, Habitat that's for what, Humanity. That's what we're trying to do is it, um, impact intergenerational poverty. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there anything else that you would like to add or encourage while you have the yeah, floor? You know, <laughs> um, we always love to do something called a Habitor. If anybody ever would like to come on a Habitor, we take them out, we show them the homes we're building, we show them the areas, and we tell them stories about the people we serve. Mm -hmm. So they can um, call that same number Eight nine three, um, um, three one seven two <laughs> extension two three two, and that's Jennifer, our development director. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we certainly thank you very much yeah. for coming out and talking to Habitat for Humanity. Uh, talking about Habitat mm -hmm. for Humanity and explaining mm -hmm. what a great impact it does uh, have on the community. And uh, I picked up a little fun fact about Habitat homeowners and. Once they do own that home, it says here um, from 2009 to 2013, Habitat homeowners paid $171,032 in property taxes here in St. Tammany, and they become consumers of that community. Oh, right. Yeah. So it's, yeah. uh, it's a big cog in the mm -hmm. economic wheel also mm -hmm. right. in that respect, That's because right. mm -hmm. now they're tax-paying homeowners and contributing right. to uh, the tax base and mm -hmm. Everything else, but we yeah. thank you so much, Jeff, oh, well, for coming out. Well, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. You're welcome, and okay. we will be right back after the break. Every child needs a place where they can grow up healthy and learn and be safe. In the Habitat House, my parents help build. My parents, my mom and daddy. I study. I grow. I learn. I live. Your support can help put a decent roof over the heads of a family like mine. Like mine. Like mine. To learn how you can help, visit Habitat.org. Getting closer to nature can get you closer to your family. discovertheforest.org. Welcome back to Get Outside St. Tammany. We're here with Jeff Boundy. He is a herpetologist for the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so let's talk about your role with the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries as a herpetologist. What do you do? I try to manage the populations of amphibians and reptiles in the state. Louisiana is a state that allows the commercial sale of most of our species, and so I have to manage them to keep that sustainable. That mm -hmm. is, we, we don't want anything being overly collected or harvested. And secondarily, I try to keep an eye on the other populations of amphibians and reptiles that aren't commercially collected. Okay, so, so we have an idea yeah. of what's out there, how many there are, where they live. And being in Louisiana, we're pretty much surrounded by water. So we got plenty of amphibians and tons of reptiles. So right. uh, let's focus today on the reptile population, specifically snakes, because right now, especially after we have heavy rains and rising waters, we see a lot of snakes 
more than usual maybe. Um, and w in the springtime when the weather was maybe cooler, sometimes they come out, you see them in the summer hiding places. So if we can talk about um, snakes of Louisiana and um, first of all, tell us why are they important to our ecosystem? Why is it important to keep their population balanced? One thing about any animal is that they have a mass, a biomass. That is, that is how much food they are available and how much food they eat out of the uh, system. So they're part of the energy cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, to use an example, let's say you have a lake with a, a heron rookery at it and a fishery. People go there to fish. Water snakes crawl around the shoreline and eat the sick and disabled fish, which keeps the fish population healthy. Okay. Then they have baby snakes. The baby snakes are food for the baby herons. Okay. And so, in a way, they're, they're good to have at your lake. Yeah, because they keep the populations of both healthy. Right. So, so what are some of the snakes um, that people might see? I know in Louisiana we have snakes pretty much all over the state. There's right. snakes that are indigenous to the entire state, some to certain areas. Particularly, let's talk about St. Tammany Parish. What would someone see out and about in St. Tammany, in any area really. St. Tammany Parish has 33 species of snakes in okay. it. And people probably have not heard of 30 of them. <laughs> you have mud snakes, racers, uh, green snakes, garter snakes, ribbon snakes, water snakes, um, coach whip snakes, pygmy rattle snakes, coral snakes, scarlet king snakes, mole king snakes, speckled king snakes, a whole lot of kinds of snakes. Right. So out of that snake population, I'm sure some of those snakes can harm you, potentially. Right. I mean, I'm sure they can all harm you if they bite you, but some of them could also inject venom, which would make you sick. And then some are just perfectly harmless, even if they did bite right. you. So can you tell us, how would a person say, can you spot a venomous snake? And if so, how can you do that? What it's are the characteristics? It's difficult to describe how to tell a venomous snake from a non-venomous snake because you have to have it in hand almost, unless you can recognize we it. We don't recommend that. <laughs> right. Uh, let's dispel one myth right away. Okay. Uh, the shape of a snake's head does not tell you whether or not it's venomous. Okay, great. So you've probably seen a lot of snakes with triangular shaped heads right. and thought, oh my gosh, it's venomous. It's probably not venomous. In fact, right. most of the snakes that you see are probably not venomous regardless of what they look like to you or regardless of what your nosy neighbor tells you that it is. Uh, snakes' lower jaws are not attached to the skull. Okay. And so they have a ligament, and so they can voluntarily flare out the back of their head. They do that to look scary. Mm -hmm. So a snake with a normally shaped head can go from that to a triangular shape almost instantly. Mm -hmm. They do that to look scary. That usually comes right before the shovel comes down on it. <laughs> Are they strikes so. though? Right, but they do that to, uh, to get you to leave them alone. Right. Basically what a snake wants is for you not to touch it mm -hmm. or get close to it. They'll crawl away when they see you coming. You probably have come upon a lot of snakes that saw you first and have disappeared. Mm -hmm. You didn't know where they were there. Right. If you get a snake out in the open though, or a lot of snakes rely on camouflage to hide. So they're going to hold still and hope that you don't see them. At the point where they decide that, aha, they see me mm -hmm. and something bad may happen to me, then right. they become defensive. And then they put on an act like, get back, stay away, right. do not touch me. And that's what they want you to do is walk in the other direction. And then they go and find shelter. So pretty much they don't want any action interaction with us at all. Right. So if you turn around, they're going to turn around too. They're not going to chase you pretty right. much. Now the venomous snakes in this area, which would be the copperhead, the cottonmouth, and the pygmy rattlesnake, mm -hmm. all have what I would call a heart-shaped head. Okay. It's not really triangular. They have venom glands behind their eyes that give it sort of a bowed out appearance. Mm -hmm. uh, cottonmouths and pygmy rattlesnakes have a dark eye with a light band across the top of it. And so what, you, what you're seeing is the facial striping passes through as a color pattern through the eye. Copperheads have a pale colored eye with a, a vertical pupil like a cat. Okay. So those, are, so those the, are pretty distinctive. Yeah. If you can get close enough. <laughs> right. Well, the cotton mouths look a lot like a lot of our harmless water snakes and pygmy rattlesnakes are very rare, but uh, unless you uh, 
have never seen one, you could assume that this might be a pygmy rattlesnake. Or if you see a snake with orange on it, which we'll see in a little bit, you might think it's a copperhead because it's coppery colored, mm -hmm. which may not be the case. Right. But um, the cotton mouths, they do have a white mouth on the inside. Is that correct? A lot of them do, but most of them don't flap it open. Open, right. So you're not going to see it. If they're hissing, yeah, their mouth's going to be open if they strike. But Cotton mouths have that behavior where they look almost straight up and they flap their jaws at you. So tell me about, say, after a, a water event where there's like a heavy rain and street flooding and stuff like that, would you see more cotton mouths out necessarily, Not necessarily or more of a certain kind of snake out? What do they do? Where do they go? And then, you know, when the well, water you, rises. Well, you look at um, the way the water's coming up. When you have a storm surge, like after Katrina hit the North Shore, mm -hmm. it threw a lot of snakes inland mm -hmm. and then for days afterwards you would see snakes moving back south towards the lakefront yeah in a different event like a flood the water rises incrementally and begins to spread out this mm -hmm. gives the snakes time to think about what they're going to do and oftentimes they'll just find shelter okay they're not necessarily being pushed by the water into your yard mm -hmm. but in any event afterwards they'll move back to where they were and that's probably when you're going to see them is when they're traveling. Okay, so and then other than say after storms or whatever, what time of year would the would we be most likely to see snakes as a rule like on a regular basis? Like what kind of weather do they like, I guess, to come out? Well, they like to come out under cover of darkness, but in the springtime and the fall, the nights are too cool or cold for them to be active. Mm -hmm. So that's when you're going to see them during the day, especially in the springtime, because they come out of hibernation, they're hungry, they, that's the mating season for a lot of them, so they're moving around doing stuff during the day. Mm -hmm. During the middle of the summer, it's hot out at night, and a lot of the snakes just switch to becoming nocturnal, and okay. so you're not going to see them crawling around in your yard unless you go out at night. Right. So let's say someone does uh, come into contact with a venomous snake and unfortunately they might get bitten or their child comes in and says, I've just been bitten. What is your first recommendation for them to do from there, that moment? There's no longer anything called first aid for venomous snake bite. Okay. You go straight to medical assistance, the okay. hospital. All right, so you get there as quickly as you can. Right, no tourniquets, no cutting, no stopping at the store for ice. None of that. All that does is delay things and, and it complicates it if you're cutting yourself open. Right. And it's, yeah, it makes it worse. Okay. So um, what about snakes in the wild? Say you're taking a hike. Just leave the snakes alone, basically. Watch from afar. Right. Snakes aren't going to attack you. Sometimes they're thought to be aggressive because they hold their ground, but oftentimes that's the kind of snake that is stuck in the open on a trail and it wants you to go around it and it wants to get safe to cover right okay. away. You can out walk a snake. Okay. They're not going to come after you. Now let's see the friend that you brought today. Okay. Take your friend out. Let's check him out. Or her. I don't know if it's a male. This male is or a her. Okay, great. This is a corn snake named Peaches, which is being brought to us courtesy of the Blue Bonnet Nature Center All in right. Baton Rouge. All right. Peaches. And corn snakes are a native snake to this area, but this is a captive bred uh, color pattern. Okay. Uh, you're not going to see this in the wild. They're usually more of a blood red and uh, deeper orangey color than this. Okay. And how big will this snake grow to? They can get about five and a half feet long, but they don't very often. Uh, she doesn't have it. One thing that's remarkable about corn snakes is they tend to have a platinum white belly with big black checker marks up mm -hmm. and down it. So it's really obvious what they are. Uh, this one, not uh, having been in the wild, is pretty tame. If you she encounter one of these in your yard in the middle of the lawn in the middle of the day and start poking at it, it's going to coil up and strike and it's going to look like a very dangerous snake. They'll vibrate the end of their tail and make them sound like a rattlesnake. Okay. And uh, basically that's so that, like I've said, it wants you to go away. It wants you to run inside your house and leave. Right. And do you recommend, I mean, I guess not recommend, but are snakes good pets? This is a captive snake or? They're easy pets. They're easy pets. Okay. Once they become calm and, and uh, acclimated to being in a cage and being fed once a week, that's basically all they do is they sit there they wait for you to feed them on Monday morning, 
and they have a water bowl and if you put a place for them to hide they'll go hide and digest their food gotcha so where would somebody learn about snakes uh, the nature center is a good spot there are okay. a few of them in this area and what about like online uh, our website www.wlf.louisiana.gov okay have a so page on snakes let's talk about if this snake would strike what kind of um harm from getting a disease or anything could I, could we expect? I mean, do snakes carry diseases that humans catch? They do not carry diseases that humans can get. They can pass diseases back and forth to each other mm -hmm. of their own kind. If you get bit by a snake, you may risk infection. If you don't clean your wound or whatever. Right, or they'll if break the skin. They have many, many tiny recurved teeth like little teeny cat claws back in there and that's how they eat. Mm -hmm. They don't have a hand, so if they grab onto a, a lizard, they got to hold on to it somehow, and those little recurved teeth hold it. Okay. So if this guy is, if, if you see a wild corn snake in your area, they're probably eating those rodents that you want to get rid of. Right. That's so the way they got their name was they used to hang around the corn crib awesome. back in the old days, and they'd eat all the rats and mice that came to eat your corn. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add for our audience about um, reptiles, amphibians? Well, one thing I'd like to repeat is that if you do see a snake, it's probably not venomous and it's not going to hurt you. Enjoy it. All right. Well, thank you, Jeff, for being thank here. We Amy. really appreciate it. This is very interesting. And thank you, Peaches, as well. So thank you very much. That's our show. And uh, we will see you next time.